So I want to say uh, I'm very excited to uh, introduce um, my uh, colleague, uh, David Shaywitz. And I'll, I've been told to go easy on the uh, introduction. Uh, David was trying to get out of that introduction, but uh, too bad. Uh, so David Shaywitz is one of the more uh, brilliant individuals, brilliant and thoughtful individuals I know. He trained here uh, in the um, MD PhD program at Harvard and has led uh, several efforts uh, in science as well as in industry. He was in Doug Melton's lab. Am I wrong about this? Yeah, yeah. Doug Melton uh, studying st uh, stem cells. And he uh, cloud based uh, genomics companies, which he may or may not tell you about. Uh, but for me, he's been uh, really a lucid uh, optimist. By that, I mean someone who really does appreciate the opportunities provided by technology and um, the opportunities that it provides to advance science, but he's not dazzled by the opportunities in such a way that allows him to sound like others, which is to sound so um, optimistic that the forecast and the timelines have no bearing uh, with reality. I have to say that he has confounded me by showing that one source of what I thought was unreasonable optis, optimism uh, was in fact uh, not unreasonable. So uh, David is not the half, a man, half the man he used to be when uh, I saw him last. He weighed, I mean, visually looked like he was twice as big as he is now. And he went with a real Silicon Valley solution, a company called Verta Health, that uh, pushes you onto a ketotic diet. And seems to me a very hard thing to do. Speaking as someone who trained in pediatric endocrinology, changing your weight and making that last over time is extremely difficult. Uh, but, and I'm too bad. I mean, I just think it's one of the most amazing things I've ever seen, uh, David. And I mean this in all seriousness, seriousness because I'm very skeptical about these kinds of lifestyle modification uh, efforts, but you succeeded. And so he's done it. Uh, I don't know if he's gonna share any sense of it, but this is actually a true Silicon Valley health story that actually worked, at least for him. <laughs> so thank you, for David, for coming. We're really appreciative. All right. All right, well, it's really nice to be back in Boston. I hear it's always this nice out, right, Zach? This is, this is it, yeah, that uh, comports with my 21 years here. So it's always been like this. Um, uh, so I'm just gonna try to take y'all on a quick tour of, um, trying to think of something useful that I could uh, share that would uh, live up to Zach's billing. And then having failed, this is what I've come up with. Um, I'm going to talk about sort of how um, pharma is looking at some of this data science and technology. And fundamentally, it's, it's, I think it's going, to, it's going to align with what, what everyone else is looking at. Um, and even the journey may be a little bit similar. Let's see. OK. So um, the idea is that pharma, like everyone else, is at the intersection of these two incredible revolutions in biology and in data. If you just look at the last week, it's been incredible with this um, GSK deal with um, uh, UCSF. Janssen did a, a deal with an AI company out here. There is a, a wearable that the FDA approved um, for pediatric IBS. A digiceutical is actually going to get reimbursed, which is probably the most remarkable item on here. Um, and then this sort of larger uh, M&A uh, with meta involving metadata. This is just an example of some of the pharma and AI partnerships. Um, so this is really the only slide you need in the talk. The rest of it is um, probably filler, like Zach would say. Um, there's incredible opportunities and challenges. People are really trying to find that they're there. Um, I think that the right mindset is um, the right mindset is a uh, critical for, um, for 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 how do you think about this? I think there's the idea that somehow tech or digital is going to somehow have these magical uh, powers which we have to get away from. Um, I don't think that. Um, but I, on the other hand, I think there are real opportunities that technology creates and trying to be thoughtfully, but thinking about how to apply them uh, and how to unlock that potential, but how to really focus on the underlying uh, scientific questions that I think are driving everybody. So uh, revolution one um, is sort of in biology, and I'm just going to use a cancer example. 
So if you think about it, going from the, the promises, the um, unbelievable promises of the original genome project with the sequencing of the genome, we'll be able to compute the organism, we'll understand what it is to be human. And then with the, uh, with the you know, STI 571 with Gleevec, um, it was precision medicine. This is it. This is the, here, look, this is the war against cancer. These are the bullets. That sounds promising. A um, couple of years later, the despair, we fought cancer and cancer won, advances are elusive. I mean, why we all remember this very vividly, um, you know, a decade ago. So, um, and then as we all know, this recently changed again with um, the incredible advances in uh, immuno-oncology, uh, evidenced by the Nobel Prize uh, uh, last year. Um, for me personally, it's been a really interesting 30-year journey with my, my undergraduate thesis was actually a lot about um, a lot of this uh, sort of T-cell receptor interaction, T-cell MHC interaction. Um, and so watching the science evolve from the sort of, you know, the starting to understand the, uh, understand it, some of the initial sequencing to this really sophisticated understanding we have now has been remarkable. What really blows me away are these the broader opportunities that we're seeing in biology and what has become commonplace on a weekly basis, literally a weekly basis, our venture team are reviewing and opportunities. I saw Pfizer invested in one today, actually. Um, I dropped like $11 billion in one, I think, uh, in a gene therapy company. Um, gene therapy, cell therapy, gene editing. I mean, and then when you go to a meeting like uh, ASGCT, people are talking about really programming in these very specific capabilities. Oh, you, you know, you sort of want a little bit of suppression here, a little bit of activation there. And they're sort of very audaciously, you know, creating cells with a range of these capabilities. It's, it's incredible that things that were dismissed as science fiction a few years ago are now being, you know, funded and in some cases are finding expressions in the clinic. I um, mean, in fact, my sense of about a year ago at the sort of the annual kind of health healthcare investor meeting, JP Morgan, was, was incredibly optimistic from a biological perspective. And then you sort of have to ask yourself, okay, well, what about the tech stuff? Is that going to happen? Uh, and so uh, I call it uh, data science and technology um, to sort of follow it. You know, you can look at it just from the covers of The Economist, from the data deluge to, aut oops, to automation, to AI, um, the Bible, Fortunate enough, we're in the promised land here. It was written down the street, apparently. Um, uh, the second machine age is sort of the reference book of this field. The good news um, is that um, people will be freed from want, drudgery, and toil. Not just us in the rich world, but everywhere. Unimaginable opportunities for innovation will transform virtually all sectors of the economy. So I guess as Bill Murray would say, so we got that going for us, which is nice. Um, it's, it's, it's a Caddyshack reference for those of you who are of a certain age. Um, yes, I, thank you. Skinny but old. Um, so, um, so this is sort of the promise, I mean, pretty explicitly stated of how all this technology is going to transform everybody. And I think this is kind of almost brings it home more than other things. If you So name this company. So advances in online and mobile are key to the success. They say the technology is difficult, it takes money, emphasis on transparency. Biggest single department is IT, staffed with digital futurists. Creative partnerships, fast fail, culture orientation to reacting quickly. All right, hipsters, so any ideas? Amazon? Dominoes. So <laughs> there's all characteristics of dominoes and uh, you know, this article sort of tongue in cheek was it's a tech company that happens to make pizza. But it is sort of interesting that that's sort of how they're looking at it. And obviously, uh, this technology is sort of certainly aspiring to transform healthcare, as I'm sure Vinod has spoken about. Um, Eric Topol is um, one, of the, one of the folks who's been championing this idea, among others. Again, The Economist is here with the uh, front page cover. Um, and the broader idea with digital health is that you can sort of, um, you know, by uh, using information and communications technology, particularly sensors, analytics, and mobile, um, we can provide a way for medicine to break out of the traditional constraints of time and space and understand sort of health where it is and, and health and illness as it really occurs versus in the, in the sort of artifice of, of a hospital in a waiting room. Um, specifically for pharma, the idea is there are sort of three ideas. Well, one, you can understand disease more granularly. You can understand the patient's experience of disease more precisely, more, more empathetically, and then ultimately forge a closer connection with the patient, adding values beyond the pill, the old solutions versus pills. 
So this is the idea of being able to do phenotype at scale, um, uh, the concept of the precision phenotype, the idea of patient-focused drug development. My, my residency colleague, Ethan Bash, has been a particular leader in this, um, really trying to understand the patient's experience of illness. And then the sort of the old idea of we don't want to sell assets, we want to really you know, wrap a whole solution around these. Um, and then I think it was a Osler, no, Mike Tyson, who said, everybody has a plan till they get punched in the face. So let's see what's happened to all this. Well, this is just an example of a, a nice um, uh, meta-analysis, uh, very rigorously done by Brendan Spiegel a year or so ago, looking at a lot of the wearables and, um, you know, in terms of impacting um, clinical outcomes, and there wasn't much evidence of benefit. Now, we shouldn't be surprised, but I, th I think the only surprise is if we're surprised. Um, because the struggles actually mirror exactly what we see with medicine. There are so many examples in the history of medicine of things that seem so intuitively obvious that to even do the study seemed unethical. The, when um, there was the idea of um, doing, um, actually Sid wrote, Sid Mukherjee wrote about this really nicely, among everything else he wrote about nicely in his Emperor of All Maladies, the idea of using, um, of doing um, bone marrow transplant for breast cancer, it seemed like such an obvious idea that not doing it, not giving people the opportunity to receive that treatment was considered unethical. There wasn't any benefit. The idea of certain of using antiarrhythmics for preventing sudden cardiac death uh, after an MI seemed obvious. It turned out it actually uh, made things worse. And, and there are a range of other examples. So you have to test everything. And just because things seem into, you know obvious, it doesn't necessarily mean that they're right. The idea, well, we'll better understand the patient and that that's going to provide an opportunity for competitive benefit. You have two drugs, but if one really provides a broader range of improvements, isn't that going to be helpful? And, you know, that's been a harder sell, too, because I think there is really, and there's obviously an interest in having drugs that are better tolerated, but there's also the view of implementing that turned out, has turned out to be, to be a real challenge in organizations because, if you have drugs that work the same, you, you know that, that have the same primary outcome. In many cases, that 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 winds up being perceived as carrying the day. And then finally, this concept of service around the device. The idea is that I mean, there's a great example from J and J actually, where they have sort of a lap band, and they said, "Oh, we're going to do this great thing where we're going to have this device, and we'll have a hotline that." staffed by really trained nurses and that any of people who receive this particular lap band will be able to call the uh, the hotline and get really good advice. This will help the patients, it'll help the surgeons, it'll help everybody, help our own business. And the reality is that in this case, at least patients didn't engage very much and rarely availed themselves of the service. And in fact, don't take my word for it, here's a former CMIO at Merck um, and now at Caremore, uh, Satan Jane, who basically said that he has seen countless initiatives to move beyond the pill and it's just it's just really hard for them to get traction. So now let's go through a worked example here, because I think it's kind of interesting. This is all a little theoretical, fine. So new CEO, um, uh, Dr. Vasnar Shyam um, uh, of uh, Novartis, uh, appointed in 20, 2018, front page story in the Wall Street Journal says, we need to become a focused medicines company powered by data science and digital technologies. Um, this is from Fight Club. How's that working out for you? Um, and here's the answer. Well, it's hard. I'm sure this is news here. Um, but it's really interesting that he said there's a lot of talk, but very little. You know, they came back, to, you know, a year later, he was um, giving an interview and he was saying, you know, it's a lot of talk, but really hard and very little in terms of actual impact. And AI, it turns out, will actually have the, have the organized data upon which to do the AI, and it's the organization, the structuring of the data that's so unbelievably challenging. And a, a colleague actually of mine, Takeda, was explaining it as she, her analogy was that it was like, um, uh, you know, sort of, of like being pregnant versus labor, that everyone focuses on the labor part of it and forgetting about all, you know, you know the, the previous 40 weeks. And she said, you know, that's kind of important. Uh, and then I think that the, you know, that? Um, a colleague at, um, Ariel Dowling, um, uh, Mackey, Stanford M. Mackey, actually. Um, and then, um, uh, so, and then he's sort of skeptical about some of the uh, emerging approaches. So the basic things that he did think works are kind of some of the operational things, like this sort of clinical trials, operations center, some finance predictions, 
they're trying to digitize some path. And he said the big fail was trying to drive insights from data lakes, you know, to just sort of stir the cauldron of data and having insights emerge. And apparently it hasn't worked yet. Um, and I think what some of this comes down to is a distinction, important and often underappreciated distinction between invention and implementation. And I think you can see this to good effect when you think about the history of the car. So on the left is the sort of the, the first of the quote modern automobile, and on the, on the right is uh, Zach's car. Um, and <laughs> and um, it's good to be the king. And um, what you what. And you say, okay, well, look, there's certain difference in the technology and the engineering. That's amazing. But actually, that's not, if that's what you were focusing on, you really would have missed a lot of the point. On the left here are what German roads looked like at the time of the first car versus something like the you know, highway, modern highway system. And so the point is, in order to be able for the technology to evolve, there has to be all this associated infrastructure to get it to work. So for example, you need gas stations. These are gas stations. These are now, you know, this is electric charging stations. This is data. Hopefully there are more. Um, and then the other thing to recognize so importantly is that implementation is not instantaneous. It's not like you have an idea. I mean, I, I maybe what I'm doing in this talk is sort of highlighting how industry, me and industry, are sort of coming to the realization when I, I get the feeling that everyone in this room has been aware of like for, for a very long time. But it, that said, that implementation is not instantaneous and that people forget about the distinction. Um, Jim Besson, who's now out here at BU, is sort of a tech entrepreneur uh, and now sort of an economist, talks how almost all the gains you see in productivity were realized only after decades of, of sort of progressive improvements of learning how to apply the new technology in, in a gainful way. Um, and these are sort of some other perspectives. So that's what Besson was saying, that you go through long periods of sequential innovation in his uh, huge book, um, uh, Professor Gordon at Northwestern talks about how the benefits, and he was talking about transportation, he was saying that the benefits to the individuals, it took, it took many, many, many decades, not just the initial invention, but you have to get the subsidiary inventions and complementary and the sub-inventions and all this incremental improvement over time before this sort of the, the genius and the eureka moment could wind up finding expression in something that really made a difference for people. And then another uh, local, um, uh, Professor Von Hippel at MIT, says the key to application or, or lead users so probably the folks in here, practitioners with, who are keen to apply an approach to a pressing problem with which they're actively wrestling. And um, can read more, this is just sort of a recent commentary I wrote that uh, about kind of an application of this using real world data that might be of interest. Now, the reason we still care about this is actually the tech really is important, the underlying science, it's the, it really completely changes the way we think about things. Sidney Brenner said that progress in science depends upon new techniques, discoveries, and ideas, probably in that order. So the idea is it really is important to pay attention to new technologies and to try to leverage them, but having some expectation that the implementation is going to be challenging. Now, for all the challenge, for all the things that are difficult, one of the, I think, almost rare, particularly in pharma, is the idea of having the, the wind at our backs in terms of uh, regulators. I think actually starting with, uh, you know, with sort of Caliph, now then with Gottlieb, and um, now we're really, really fortunate to have a deputy commissioner like uh, Amy Abernethy. Um, regulators, by and large, aren't really the problem, to be honest with you. They were traditionally viewed as a barrier. They are if anything, pulling people along in many cases. They are really trying to work with everybody to try to accelerate the use of emerging technologies. So that's a real positive. I thought it would be helpful to sort of present kind of five examples of the, of the need to balance the opportunities and hazards of data science in pharma. Um, and, you know, it's sort of how everything is, can be sort of like a mixed blessing. So one, we're sort of dealing with what's been called um, not just astronomical, but uh, genomical levels of data, just unbelievable amounts of data, um, which provides incredible opportunities as we were discussing for analysis. On the other hand, this has also led to the challenge of sort of what, what's been called the dictatorship of data, where we collect and worship and really fetishize data for its own sake without a sense or thoughtful plan of what to do with it and sort of invoke it and sort of, you know, say, well, the data will speak to us, the data will do it. But, you know, this is this 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 can really lead to a, to a, a number of problems, um, uh, not just sort of, you know, from some of the biases inherent in the data, but from kind of almost 
um, relying too much on, but but from sort of imp uh, imbuing too much power in almost a volume of data versus being thoughtful about how it's applied and giving it too much almost moral authority. Two, okay, exceptional new tools. So this is um, there's a, you know this new um, Google algorithm uh, for playing a Go. Uh, called Alpha Zero that did really well. And then there was a Valentine to it written um, by a mathematician in the New York Times where he said it was humankind's first glimpse glimpse of an awesome new kind of intelligence. Um, and this kind of reminded me, if you've, again, to date myself, if you've ever seen Annie Hall, this was sort of like, I lurfed you, I luffed you. And it was just, he, they really, really appreciated this. Um, this author really appreciated this algorithm and thought it was just you know, the bee's knees or whatever, really, to date myself. Um, on the other hand, I think it's really important to recognize that these powerful new techniques can also generate a number of very, a number of tricky uh, false positives. This is um, Imran Hack, who is um, a, a sort of a Stanford CS guy who was um, at Council and then Freenome, um, and it's going to be on an upcoming podcast we have, um, you know, and uh, talks about how essentially with these incredible techniques, um, and a relatively small number of patients, it's almost inevitable that you overfit things. And so there's a tendency where people run these amazingly powerful algorithms, find these incredible correlations or these incredible almost narratives around it and say, oh, look, we can fit it perfectly. We now have this, you know, complex biomarker that works perfectly. And, you know, it, it really almost an incredible amount number of them are, are sort of false positives. But there, I mean, I can't tell how many business plans I've seen that are sort of based around this premise. Okay, opportunity number three this is one of my favorite people, Amy, uh, Andy Corvo is out here. Um, you know, he's made some nice diagrams and about the about all the opportunities for innovation across pharma. And I think the way some of this gets expressed is people are like saying, and I'm like Benoit probably like. Pharma is big and dumb, and we're going to fix it. We're going to disrupt it, and we're going to boom. We're going to, you know, just it's going to be, it's, you know, it's, it's go the way of the dinosaur. We're we're going to fix it with with technology. We're going to take drug discovery processes that took six six years and reduce it in silico to five minutes. Um, and I think what's important to recognize is how many steps are involved in drug development. There's a great blog by um, Derek Lowe, who's very grounded, he's talking about like Lucid Optimist, um, who just sort of is kind of a medicinal chemist by training. And he just sort of looks at these and laughs and talks about all the different steps that are involved in for anything in drug development. I mean, anything in medical discovery and says, even if you can optimize one very specific step, there are so many other steps that some of the folks who are coming at it from, from without that um, domain expertise don't always fully appreciate. Um, opportunity four is this idea of um, cultural synergy. And this is the idea of the sort of the Silicon Valley, the, the sort of innovative spirit. The idea that by, re, you know, this is like when Voss was saying, we're gonna reimagine Novartis as a medicines and data science company. And the idea is that the sort of the tech in it, and I, I mean, I, I really buy into a lot of this, to be honest with you, that the sort of the, innovation associated with tech is going to re-energize the rest of the company and then the rest of the company is going to inspire the tech people and you're going to get this sort of one plus one equals three equation um, and then the, the other part of it and again your trainee a tool uh, kind of you, you sort of see a lot of the other thing that pharma is kind of used to working with statisticians to do very specific tasks as a service and the, the data science mindset is, which we're going to get to on the next hazard, is, is it's a non-trivial adjustment. It's a completely different way of thinking about it. I mean, a lot of the data science approach is let's put all the data here and figure out what it means. Whereas when you're collecting data, you know, in, in, actually in healthcare, you know, you're collecting it for one particular purpose and then you're trying to repurpose it for another. Which brings us to opportunity number five, leveraging existing data. So by making it possible and easier to access, retrieve, and reuse existing data, the thought is that farmers could derive enormous benefit. And literally what I'm showing here is like a Google search yesterday. Like this currently of like, you know, something about like value and data, and there you go. What shows up? BCG and McKinsey. We're going to double pharma value, which sounds good. My goodness. Um, and revolutionize pharma R&D with data and data science. Um, on the other hand, the, in practice, this has been really difficult. And in part of it, you know, people are always making analogies to Google and Facebook, for example. Say, look how great they're doing all their analysis. Um, and first of all, there's a sort of a separate like group of like 
irritated ad tech bloggers who say actually the, the the technology is less effective than you think it is. It's just there's not a very high criteria for evaluation. It's not like it has to go through the FDA. Um, but second, basically they're sort of like these um, you know almost you know these sort of um, there are apps that exist just to draw in customers and, and to monetize the data exhaust. So it's just sort of the little bits of the exhaust, a huge long tail of it, that's what's being monetized. Whereas in, you know, it's literally, they're, they're, you know, what they say, if it's free, you're the customer, you know, you're paying for it. Um, but in pharma, and actually, you know, in the, you know for medical, in, a, in medical systems as well, it's, there's considerable value attached to the primary data themselves. So each data set that you're doing contributes, to, you know, to a potentially very high value FDA application. Each the person who's doing the, the preclinical, the person who's doing each of you know, the talks, each stage of those, the very specific data set that they are trying to capture, you know, has actually a lot of intrinsic value, which leads to a myopic focus on collecting and analyzing data for a very specific and locking it down for a very specific primary purpose. So the the real questions, um, which everyone's wrestling with, and it's the second one here I want to get to, is first, what would be required to enable these data to be easily retrieved and utilized? And it's, it's non-trivial because of the huge, it's not just a saying, okay, well, let's like put all the data from the different file rooms and put them in the gymnasium or put them in some common area where everyone can nominally access them. It's all the, it's the, the, the crux of it is the metadata and trying to figure out, well, what do you associate with the data and how do you do it? And it, doesn't it depend on the application? And it's obviously an incredibly difficult problem. And the problem you have in an organization, I know you have it in medical centers, it's um, what is the concrete evidence that there's real value in doing this? So you, you go to all these people who are in pharma companies who are doing all these, who are paid to do do the farm, do the this, and collect the data for very specific purposes. And now you say, I want you to rework all your workflow, or I want you to think about it all differently, and because we're going to collect all this data and store it in a way that's going to allow for much better reuse. And then, you know, people are like, oh, yeah, you know, like it's a corporate, and so what, what the way it looks like, this is essentially what the situation is in most pharmas, where the C-level suite is sort of like um, Picard or someone is sort of like, make it so. Um, and then... People who are, are like, do, you know, in the trenches, like, they're like, my goodness, um, there's all this work they're trying to do. They're trying to hit their daily deliverable. They're trying to, you know, do the you know, trials. They're trying to do all the work. And now here's this sort of um, initiative that says, oh, data science, you know, make it all. So it's just like added work, and no one sees the benefit of it. Like very few people who are actually in the trenches. It's not like Uber. Uber, you push a button, a car shows up. Like. You, you understand viscerally why that is helpful to you. Here, you're sort of like, oh, we have to migrate our data and we have to change this and we have to have all these meetings to what end? And I think as it becomes, if and when, and I believe it's going to be a when, it becomes more clear how that is beneficial. Because the argument, right, is that by making the data more, you know, uh, more analyzable, there's going to be all this additional value that's going to come from that. We're going to be able to come up with new insights. And believe me, I've seen every business plan about this. It's like we're going to repurpose this and repurpose that and change everything. And there's always some promising rat study or whatever. Um, but, you know, let me see the drugs. And so I think it's just there's a lot of promise. And as it starts to really become, as it becomes real, I think that's going to be an incredibly exciting opportunity. There are some, I won't, I see I'm almost out of time. There are a number of promising initiatives, um, which I think are optimistic. Um, second to last slide here. I think the real thing here is to move from what I call the dancing bear view of all this to palpable value. And a lot of the stuff about data and technology now is, is what I would sort of describe as like analogous to the, the quote about the dancing bear, where the wonder is not how well the bear dances, but that he dances at all. So it's like, oh, here's something that we've solved, but with AI, or here's da da da, da with, you know, now with a, you know, it's sort of like the new thing with the fortune cookie, but instead of like in bed, it's with AI. Um, but the whole thing is, okay, so you're able to do something with AI and sort of show like a demonstration or a proof of something. And that's fine, but now that real, what people want are compelling examples that investing in all this stuff will really impact how medicines are, um, are developed. And it may be a lot of what Zach was saying that, you know, 
that you're going to need people, whether in startups or in academia, and ideally a combination of everywhere, to really demonstrate how this is done. So we're looking to you. Um, just just a, a bunch of thank yous because the new need friends, um, Zach, have been particularly inspiring here, uh, and a, a list of other colleagues as well. So um, thank you for your time. Thank you, uh, David. Uh, I felt ripped off every one of those slides. I wanted you to uh, expound upon. Don't go away. All right. That was that was uh, very uh, thoughtful, and I thought um, alighted a lot of uh, important discussions. Was it optimistic and lucid. It was lucid. It was optimistic, but also uh, asked a crushing question, which is. Implicitly, which is, in fact, if you talk to various individuals in pharma, there are some processes that are that are actually big that are so obviously not productive um, at the at the micro level, and then at the macro level, you keep seeing these drug companies betting again and again on the same Alzheimer uh, process. And one feels that there could be a role for greater human slash machine intelligence in, in making the decision. But I think you raise a good point. It's not obvious how to implement. And I think yeah. another part of the challenge is it's really hard to have technology solve a social problem. And so, sorry, it's really hard to have technology solve a social problem. And, and so much of the issues of what we're all dealing with, I mean, I'm sure even the Alzheimer's stuff, is no, because you know, I mean, you're talking about billions of dollars of failed study, failed phase three studies, um, you know, on this, you know, based on this hypothesis. And you know, is it bad technology or is it just how decisions are made in organizations? And you know, it's, it's a really interesting combination. What you'd hope is that with improved technologies, you could empower people, and particularly people deeper in the organization, to be able to make more compelling arguments to make different decisions. But again, um you're right. It's one would hope, but it's it's very difficult. And the problem is, um, pharma. We all recognize are very big uh, organization. It's hard to make um, to be not, smart. Not nimble like partners. It's uh, yeah. Exa well, exactly where I was going, which is our hospitals are equally large. They're equally constrained by a multiplicity of constraints that we are barely aware of, which probably leads to uh, Krishna's observation about how the CEOs are both aware of the problems, but feel relatively powerless to address them. Uh, but that's not a good uh, attitude uh, going forward. So we have to think about how can we actually, uh, I don't want to use the D word, how do we actually improve uh, our healthcare well, system. It's a challenge. It's sort of like it's it's like the quote that's erroneously attributed to Henry Ford, right? About how if you ask people what they wanted, it would be faster horses. Yeah. But that's kind of true. I mean, what people want is to do what they're doing a little bit more efficiently. I mean, actually, the, you know, this there these uh, there, there was this you know, whatever the show was how we built this. Talking about the guys who made Airbird, you know, Silicon right. Valley shoes or whatever. And they were the guy used to work on um, you know doing consulting for these gas companies. Or you know, for these, net, you know, like Exxon or whatever, and he goes. They always talked about sustainability, but at the end of the day, it wasn't that they were insincere. But what they, the thing that would wind up getting the most traction was just things that would make their existing processes, you know, 0.001 percent more efficient, and that's sort of what everyone could sort of understand. Um, so it, it, I mean, and that's you know, that's the challenge because you know, on the one hand, that's why. People like Vinod want to, you know, dis I hate the word too, but I want to disrupt it. Say, oh, someone can sort of figure out how to do this better. But then, you know, with a with a system that has so many interdependencies, it's really challenging. So well, this is a rare opportunity to have someone who's had so much experience with medicine and with technology um, and understands information technology um, at your beck and call, so to speak. Any questions for for David? People. Yes. So, so you talked uh, very significantly about how so much of this innovation takes decades and decades uh, to yield anything. Um, do you think we maybe need some uh, self delusion in order to move anything forward? Because no one yes. really think, oh, I have a business plan that will only take 30 years. Um, no one wants to do that, no one will fund it. So, how do we overcome that other than self delusion? 
Oh, um, I <laughs> strongly in favor of self-delusion. Um, no, and, and in fact, you know, if, if there's one common attribute of, of every entrepreneur, I, I think it's not just because it's convenient to say it, but everyone says, oh my God, if I had any idea what was involved, I never would have started. I mean, if there's like a common feature of it. Um, but I think you sort of get in and, and you just sort of, you know, you get in deeper and deeper and deeper, and then all of a sudden you're, you're sort of swimming in it. Um, so, um, and interestingly, so, um, but hang on, I have to make sure I don't, somehow this is not misinterpreted. Of, of all the, there was a very, a, a kind of this devastating um, uh, HBO show about a Theranos, right? Um, which, you know, which really is sort of appropriately captured, you know, all, all the, this sort of bad behavior and, uh, and all of that. It was terrific. And then they sort of interviewed this um, um, Dan Ariely um, at, at Duke, you know, who's sort of this behaviorist. Um, and, you know, and, you know, and they're sort of like, maybe you're interviewing him, hoping he would say, shame, shame, shame. But he was sort of highlighting, I think, exactly what you were saying, comp not defending the company, he was like, what they did is wrong, but how you do need a mix of, you know, some sort of um, aspirational belief to, to try to change anything. Because if you're ultra grounded, you're never going to do anything. So it's sort of trying to find that balance. And then, you know, what's the right balance? I mean, I really am drawn to this um, Folkman, you know, Judah Folkman, you know, um, uh, quote. So, uh, brilliant surgeon uh, at Harvard Medical School, trained generations of uh, Harvard Medical students and uh, also had an amazing uh, perspective on science. Right, and so people you know, here sort of saying, okay, well, how do you know essentially if you're persistent or stubborn, right? And the real answer is, depends how it comes out. Like you can't know in the middle of it which one you are. So people have these like, you know, sort of little heuristics. Oh, well, if you're doing this, or if you're passionate, or if you're not passionate, if you can market, you don't know. I mean, it's, that's, that's the, um, crux of it, where you you don't know when you're in the middle of it if you're stubborn, you know, and you're sort of sticking to something, you know, the world is flat, darn it, or if it's just really this great new idea and you maybe you're right, if you just, you know, like it's like the rule of holes, you know, rule one, stop digging, or is it, gosh, if we just do a little bit more, this is where, where it'll be. So there isn't a simple answer, but sort of having an appreciation for that at least may offer some context. We're going to ask Dr. Omer, but I have to say, I must get my thyroid checked. So I'm freezing in here. I'm going to run back to my office and get a, a, a jacket. Dr. Omen. Yes. I'm going to get a Harvard one. Dr. Omen, you had a question. Yes. I'm uh, curious about the phenomenon of group thinking. From a positive perspective, I find it curious. Because you have two developments where one is a chain of sucker program. And the other is inspired. The other is a Right. Um, so I would say two, two different things for a tool. Ask a tool. You know, I would say I would refer you, refer you to a tool. I mean, I think that it's been a process to build it up, mm -hmm. and I think getting people to agree to share at any level has been a, a real, real challenge, because of the competitive nature of healthcare. That's really actually one of the problems. I mean, n not his words, but like a two hypothetical Bay Area systems that might have considered merging um, were to share data. I mean, they're advertising against each other more or less on the you know on the media in California more or less. I mean, almost, um, and certainly their staffs are. So it's, you know, if, if, oh, if there's some data that could be, suggest someone's not doing something perfectly, it could be used competitively. So it's it's a real, you know, fighting against that and having the data be used for good, I think is something that they're certainly trying to. I'm on a data committee, I can tell you this, at, a, at a UCSF, where they're trying to, being UCSF, it's how do you use data for justice? So, uh, you know. Um, wow. So anyway, it's what you'd expect. Um, and, you know, very thoughtful, um, making the world a better place. Yeah. Um, the um, the Chan Zuckerberg that's really interesting. The most interesting part about it is that, uh, the guy who runs it, Sean Parker, is sort of become a savant on um, immunotherapy. He, you know, it wasn't his background. What, what, none of it was, but he's so passionate about it. People say he, you, know, you show up to meetings, and he knows more than almost anybody else in the room. And I think that he's, on the one hand, he's brought a lot of people together. I think the structure of that initiative is 
very, very exciting. The way they're thinking about data is very, very exciting. The way they sort of have optimized certain processes for getting up trials and for getting approvals is very exciting. So I would say I'm actually really optimistic about the value of that initiative. Um, I think human nature is also human nature, you know, and to your point, you know, it's, it's tough balance because you don't want to, I mean, maybe some, you know, sort of just some, maybe some Green New Deal stuff, but in general, I don't, I think having people, an element of people being competitive and an element of it probably does help drive things forward. So how do you achieve that balance of where you're sharing, but people are still wanting to drive forward is really what I think everyone is striving towards. Well, I think, we, uh, first of all, let's thank David for a brilliant talk. Uh,